the question that we want to answer is how much does the customer work? Right? That's a very simple question, but lots of companies, they, they probably don't have the answer if you ask. Uh, CFO doesn't have the answer. CMO doesn't have the answer. CEO doesn't have the answer. Um, lots of companies that they want to calculate customer lifetime value, but they cannot uh, for whatever reason. Right? So I'll go back to this slide one more time. And let me show you the customer-centric refocuses, right, the attention. So in the past, in general, everything the enterprise companies do is product centric. It is that, you know, we have a software package, right? How do we market that so software package? Uh, all the metrics, all the KPIs uh, around the product itself. All the activities and transactions is, is around the product as well. Um, and everything, you know, is kind of centered about the product, right? Similar question, similar example would be, you know, now we have written a book, for example, right? And this book is our product. So everything I do, you know, is kind of focusing on this book instead of focusing on the customers. So um, from the product-centric mindset to customer-centric mindset, that means, you know, we're shifting from product focus to customer focus. We're shifting from transactional, ba transactions-based um, relationship to you know life cycle relationship. We're also shifting from acquiring customers to more of acquiring, developing, and retaining customers with retention. The um, with with emphasis on retention, right? Because if, no matter how many customers you acquire, if you don't. <coughs> take actions to keep them, eventually, you know, all of them will go away, right? Will leave. So, um, product profitability, that's a measure from product perspective. I don't think it's going, going to go away. Uh, in a company, they're still doing that. But, you know, a lot of times, we starting to talk about customer profitability. And we, you know, treat customer as a unit of um, analysis, right? Just like we talked about last class. So, transaction, transaction meaning, let's say, one-time purchase. So if you go to my store, you made a purchase one time, oh, and then no, our relationship no. ends, oh. right? Yeah, okay. uh, that's kind of product-centric or transaction-based. And now, you know, you made that transaction, I have your data, mm -hmm. and I'll keep on engaging you so that, you know, we, you can, you'll come back or repeat repeat purchase right mm -hmm. and we have kind of building this kind of you know um, company and customer relationship long term <coughs> all right so go to the next uh, how much does the customer work right so in the past we talked about how much revenue we have generate we have generated from this customer how much profit that we have made right from these customers um, the the kind of new ground is to introducing the customer lifetime value. So lifetime value is a forward-looking approach. It is based on revenue profit, but you know it is not based on just historical numbers, right? It, it actually makes assumptions to look into the future and do this lifetime value assessment and use this value to guide business decisions. Okay, so. Um, Let's talk about a case, right? And this case is about a company called BHI. BHI is a Berkeley Home Improvement um, company. It's a local competitor to Home Depot type of business, um, specializing in materials for home improvement. Um, it runs a program called Save Car Saver Card program. And this program allows the customers to earn credits so that they can attend free home improvement classes, right? So if they spend two hundred dollars, they can they can they can get they get one hour free. I think it's kind of free class type of thing. <coughs> they can sit in a classroom or a workshop to learn home improvement um, skills, techniques. So um, BHR has determined from their customer data that for the average 
saver card holder, the revenue is about $200 per year of sign up, um, and the cost of you know, that revenue is 60%, right? And your cards? Yeah. So marketing cost is $25 per year because to run the uh, home improvement class, there's the cost associated with it. Usually, you don't take ongoing marketing cost into uh, consideration. So this is some of the basics, right, of this case. And let's take a look, you know, um, how to calculate customer lifetime value. The first question is how far into the future that we are looking, right? If you look at, you know, if you do for the looking calculation of the customer value, are you taking one year, two year, or three years, right? The rule of thumb is three, three to five years. There are other kind of consideration, which I'm going to talk about in the next uh, a few slides. But the rule of thumb is three to five years. Sometimes, you know, uh, it can go as high as seven to ten years. But to be conservative, right? To be so they kind of equilibrate with depreciation schedules. It, exactly. <laughs> it's kind of similar, right? Um, although, you know, it's not talking about exactly depreciation, mm -hmm. but, you know, it is sort of customer churn is kind of similar to depreciation, right? Yeah. Customer value depreciates year over year. Um, <clears throat> so, so this is a calculation, right? So um, you first, Decide how many years that you want to do the calculation. Um, you you know you build up model to do that, and the first element, right? You are taking into consideration is revenue. Um, so as we talked about in the previous slide, the revenue is two hundred dollars per year. Uh, yeah, per year. So if they spend two hundred dollars on that saver card program, they got. Um, one free workshop or one free session, which costs $25 um, dollars, right, per customer. And, you know, the cost of that $200 revenue is $120. That means, you know, there is a kind of gross margin of about $80 per customer, right? If you do the calculation, profit equals revenue minus cost of goods minus marketing cost, right, the first you know, as of today, of course, nothing happens, but by end of year one, you have $55 as a profit, right? Going forward, you have this profit, um, same profit every year for the, for the next five years. Just keep in mind, this exercise had, had the assumption that revenue does not change. Yeah. Uh, in the real world, you know, <laughs> this can change, and this could change drastically. Um, the <coughs> One way for you to get this number is to look into you know your historical transactional data to see what are the typical customer spend in the first year, second year, and third year. Uh, we are actually going to have a um, another case on that, so um, don't concern, don't don't worry too much about that, and you know just keep in mind this is just you know based on some assumptions, right? So the total customer profit is two hundred seventy-five dollars. Um, there are some things that not considered, um, which should consider but have not considered. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> do you want to do? Do you want to guess what are they? Well, the, the cost of goods does that cover the employees and the, the cost of the store and you know is that all factored in there? I think that's usually all factored oh. in. Yeah, but you know sometimes you can you can kind of list them out separately depending on which is the area that you want to examine mm -hmm. using mm -hmm. this tool. So in this case, for example, marketing cost could have been included in cost of goods sold, but it listed out separately because we want to and we you know we need to use this approach to assess marketing mm -hmm. um, uh, marketing. That Especially since that's a big part of how they conduct their business. That's, that's right. Thing you keep saying. Yeah, that's right. So anybody want to guess what is the problem with this? So there are two problems with this calculation. So one is that the profit earned five years later are less valuable than profits earned today, right? So that's that's a time value mm -hmm. kind of problem. You know, many of them has accounting or finance background should have known that. Um, 
it is whenever you know you calculate the value to today, you definitely want to use the so-called present value, which having the cost of um, capital taken into consideration. Okay, so that's the first one. The second problem is customers may not be around in five years, right? So the assumption that you know the, com <laughs> the, the customer will be here in five years that is actually usually not real, right? Right. Yeah, guess you know you go to so many different you get you go to so many different stores, so many different places to to, to, to make the purchase. <clears throat> how much time um, that how many times that you still go back to all of them, right? You probably will go back a small set of those 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 you know shopping shopping sites, shopping you know the, those uh, those those places, but not all of them. So to them, you are a cus the customer that left after some sort of transaction. Isn't it likely though that, you know, especially in a home improvement type situation, that someone who's come for five years spends more, gradually spends more because they're more vested into the store, they, they yeah. know all the sales people and so forth. So even though you lose some, this guy by the fifth year, if he's still around, he's probably spending more money. Yeah, or, exactly. Or on the other hand, you may have finished Spend the less. projects yeah. for the house yeah. too. So. So, so you know that's the assumption of the revenue, right? The revenue is could you know um, I just change the cursor again. So the revenue could go up and down. Yeah. Again, you know if you don't have historical data, all you can do is make the best guess or you know estimate. But if you have historical data, I think you can use historical customers' um, uh, purchase history to calculate this pretty pretty precisely. Because consumers that usually follow the same pattern, very similar pattern. Yeah, assuming um, this all linear is pretty naive. That's right. <laughs> I actually have an exercise for you later um, to change some of these levers, I call it factors or levers of our TV. Can you even do that exercise? Let's assume of 70% retention rate. So, first of all, assuming 70% retention rate, right? And this 70% retention rate is probably common, um, you know, in the retail industry, but I'm not sure and I don't care, right? And that is really the number, you know, getting from historical, um, from, from the customer purchasing history, from historical data. So assuming that is not going to change in the next five years, um, we apply the 70% retention to this customer, so the chances of you know this customer is still staying is only seventy percent right by end of the first year, and that percentage goes to 40, 49 percent by end of the second year. So you need to have that adjusted, right? Okay, so have that adjusted, you get a profit expected of you know uh, thirty nine dollars in the first year, twenty seven second year, and so on. That is one hundred oh seven dollars. You can see that this number is much less than the number without the churn con into consideration. So actually, churn is very very critical to lots of companies, right? Um, Amazon has that problem. <coughs> Netflix has that problem, and even one percent of retention increase can mean lots of profit for them. So especially when you do such a model, you need to make some wild assumption. But you know, the 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 more detailed, more accurate that you can do, your model will be more accurate. Meaning, if you based on assumption on purely seventy percent, right, the result that you get is probably too inaccurate to be useful sometimes. Yeah. But if you go to your transaction history or the history table. And get you know the probability, calculated probability of say for the first year customer, second year customer, <laughs> that is more close to reality, and that will make your analysis more accurate to reflect yeah. the truth. Cool. Yeah, because because you can show just as well. This is you know a projection, but when you go back and look at the metrics, you, this could be a report of yeah. the last five years of what goes on. Oh yeah, exactly, exactly. So I don't know how many of you guys having had you know some data analysis experience. It's basically you're looking into your database to pull information out, right? As a report, as a dashboard, or do some analysis to just get get some of these metrics. So those is the step that you have to do prior to building this forward-looking model. 
because those are the assumptions they're going to make. How can I use cost value to guide business decisions? Right? So the purpose is not to get that number. Getting that number is not, is not, is not the ultimate goal. The goal is to use that, use that number to guide business decisions. So this is the exact questions that you asked. Right? So the next slide, I've listed uh, a few use cases not to say this is all of the use cases, this is just, you know, the use cases mostly from customer um, management perspective as well as from uh, marketing perspective, right? So the application of LTV concept can be applied to acquisition, development, retention, basically the entire life cycle of customers. Um, use cases such as should we extend the gift of appreciation to first-time customers or not, right? So have you ever go to a store, you know, while they run a promotion saying if you purchase, you know, certain merchandise today, they'll give you a gift, <laughs> right? So that is the application. But, you know, if they really want to do a good job, they want to calculate, right, the LTV or the equivalent to assess whether does it make sense to, you know, from profitability perspective for them to give in that gift to you uh, to acquire you as a customer, right? So, um, I think oftentimes they probably don't do that. That would be too much work. Uh, what they usually do is that they make that, that gift is cheap, cheap enough, right? So that they really don't need to, you know, concern about the um, the initial cost. Well, sometimes, sometimes it's pretty generous. I remember when we were approached to convert uh, AT&T to Direct TV. Yeah. The sign-on, uh, the customer appreciation we got was a three hundred dollar Costco. Card. I know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So that was pretty substantial. I know. So even today, right? If you go to uh, open a Chase check account, checking account, or savings account, I, can, I think still you can get anywhere between $200 to $400. So I, I believe, you know, they have calculated the LTV um, kind of, you know, thoroughly, and they, they must have known that even if give you a $200 kind of sign on um, incentive, they are still going to make a fortune, right, out of you be a customer. They need to know why that doesn't make sense for that gift, that cost associated to customer acquisition right, uh, making sense to, you know, the lifetime value of customers. They must have done a lifetime value uh, calculation versus profitability or a revenue calculation is because, you know, lifetime value is the only way that, you know, they can have uh, overall um, <laughs> estimate of the overall uh, customer, life, the customer value in each life cycle, okay? So um, just to read through some of this, how much can we pay a salesperson to acquire a customer, right? This is on the other hand. Um, the, the, the first scenario is directly giving incentives to the customer, right? And this is kind of giving incentives to the salesperson. Uh, sometimes, you know, companies giving incentives to partners as well, right? Just to acquire a new customer. Um, does that make sense? Um, you know, they have data. They better to have data to back up that decision. Um, they also have um, this should we lower the upfront fee for customers, right? If you remember, you know, if you, let's say, sign up a cell phone plan, some of the phones that you can get for free, right? And think it's kind of, you know, it's, it's falling into this, yeah, it's falling into this category. The, the, the examples for development application is that what features will most appeal to existing customers um, so that if we kind of include enhance our product, right, with those features, that's going to be a cost, right? So does that make sense to, for us to basically include that feature or not? Really, you know, LTV can, can, can help make that decision as well. So which incentives should we offer customers to increase order size? This is also in the development stage. Um, it's kind of, you know, in, in, in incentivize them to purchase more. Um, lastly, about retention, right? Does it pay to reduce the overall quality of response time from eight minutes to two minutes? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, this is, this, this is about customer service, right? Lots of people don't like to wait on 
phone for eight minutes to get you know the service web's attention, right? So some of them will will, will get angry and leave leave the service, leave the product, right? Mm -hmm. Forget about it. Well, that's why a lot of them are, a lot of the help desks now are doing callbacks. You know, the, ah, current, okay. the current the current wait time is twenty seven minutes. If you want us, yeah, if, or uh, if you want us to call you back at yeah, this we'll number, you know, press one. The last one is to hear: Should we proactively lower service fees for at-risk customers? Mm -hmm. So let's say you know if you are a, a angry customer, right? So are we you know trying to lower your service fee uh, or not, right? Or you know if you are a customer that you know not utilize our product to the extent <laughs> that we wanted you to use, are we going to you know lower your service fee and put you in a kind of second price? price level so that you pay less for that. Does it really make sense for us to do that? So um, that can be answered by LTV calculation as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we talk about the use cases, right? So now let's talk about you know one example to demonstrate uh, one of the use cases. Um, so you know you know how LTV is used to make business decisions. So to to do that, we um, use the case called um, Tuscan Lifestyle. It's the catalog company. Um, catalog companies basically, you know, they send you a catalog of merchandise. I believe you know many of you have received right in the mail that you know a very nice booklet. Well, well, it has lots of you know uh, things on it. Um, many of them just exactly what they offer, although you know what you receive may not be this company. Right? Um, those catalogs, markets, um, cookwell, tablewell, linens, decorative home accessories, right? lots of those things. Uh, they send you maybe once a quarter, right? Um, you can place the order if you see something that you really like. I I think I I had the impression that their price is always pretty high. Is that right? Yeah. 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 It, it's very high, <laughs> but it's because you know. You cannot compare the price with other, with you, you. You probably will not find the same product in other places. So there's no way for you to compare exactly right, the price of their price versus you know the same product. Well, well. Like yeah. Stuff like that. It, exactly. But the thing is that you can compare gen general categories and you can find their products usually pretty high in price. This this is the kind of the entire process. So one is that first is that. It get a list of names from data provider, or it already have a list of customer base from somewhere, right? So that usually has a cost with it. With it is is really you know how much per 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 name per address. Yeah. <coughs> so um, I don't know if the post office sell that information. Probably not. No, no. But there's uh, data aggregators who yeah. sell that. And they they will sell you the list of names for uh, any combination of mm -hmm. parameters and everything you put together. If you want to have right. people that just have bought cookware linens and everything like that, uh, that's what they do, you know, uh, as a service. And they will customize lists and sell it to you for a lot of money. Got it, got it, got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Lots of people do that in B2B as well today. Um, and lots of people are doing that by introducing AI, right, artificial intelligence into that process. Um, Demandbase is actually one of the, one of the companies um, provide that service. It's not, it, it does not sell the data itself, it's actually pr providing a platform right. for companies to do marketing. Um, but, you know, it's a very similar business model. So, um, it got a list of names, they sent those catalogs to those names, um, those, you know, this is basically the product that they're promoting through the catalogs. And typically, the response rate is 2.3 percent. I'm not sure how good this response rate is. For those of you in the retail industry, probably you, you have a better idea. Um, but for B2B, you know, our response rate or our conversion rate is usually less than this. I think B2B is less than this. So lastly, right, the customer. But they're not staying long, customer churns. So uh, this company, Tuscan Lifestyle, needs to con continuously prospecting for new customers. Okay? So this is some background about this case. Let's move on to the business decision to make. They, they want to know if 
the company should offer a free gift, um, this is called Olive Dish, to customers with their initial purchase. Because they have found out that a competitor, a competitor catalog has um, has had a good, very good success, right, with an appreciation gift, um, and the competitor increased uh, response rate by forty percent. Okay, so yeah, so they knew that um, <coughs> through you know whatever competitive intelligence sort of thing. And they want to do the same thing, right? Do, doing, they want to do the same thing. They have find out this gift, and this gift happened to be costing uh, $1.45 $1 uh, for, the, for the material and $2 for shipping and handling. So it's a total of $3.42 cost to, um, to offer this gift to <coughs> initial purchase customers, right? <clears throat> so here are some of the data points. The cost of renting names, 10 cents per name. Uh, the typical response rates are 2.3%. If, if they offer this, this gift, um, they anticipate they're, you know, they, they're going to increase the uh, response rate 40% as well, just like their competitors. Considerably yeah. three. Yeah. <clears throat> and, um, uh, however, there's a downside, right? Because now you offer something free to the customers, and some some of the customers uh, may 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 be you know cost sensitive customers or they like free stuff, but they really don't like to continue purchasing um, Tuscan's other products in a higher price, right? So those customers that that kind of diluted the average order size, um, uh, they anticipate you know the average. Initial order size, I think not just initial, the, the you know ongoing order size is going to decrease by 10 percent, right? That's the free product mm -hmm. effect. So these are some of uh, these are kind of the um, details um, about that they have data points that they have. The the question is that you know how do we how do they make that decision? Right? So let's move on. Uh, we can do a, uh, we can answer the question with the LTV calculation. So um, approach is to analyze the behavior of customers who were rented in one occasion uh, five years ago. So what does this mean, right? It's basically you know if they want to use LTV uh, approach to helping uh, making the business decision, they need to have kind of five year of purchasing history, right? About five exactly five years ago, you know they have. Ran, they have run such similar campaign uh, catalog basically. They run si similar catalog. Um, you know, what are the kind of data points for that batch of customers, right? So here are, you know, the things, the data points that they needed. The number of prospects rented, the number of prospects who became customers. For the next five years after they became customers, um, their you know revenue every year, variable cost every year, marketing cost every year, and percentage of acquired customers that are still active right after five years. So these are um, the data points that needed for the LTV calculation. So let's move on to the next slide, and you can see here this is the, this is the information coming from that analysis. So the number of prospects rented five years ago was over 143,000 and percentage customers, I'm sorry, percentage of those people becoming customers, 2.3%, that is, you know, 3,296, right? So basically this number times 2.3%. <laughs> um, the initial marketing acquisition cost is 10 cents per rented name, right, that mentioned. All right, so we talked about marketing cost, right? So um, for this particular, you know, catalog campaign, um, 10 cents, right, per rented name, and 75 cents for each catalog made, meaning, you know, uh, there's a, I think that's the mailing cost. Right. Yeah, for each catalog. So the total acquisition cost um, is the total number because you have sent catalogs to all of them, right? Mm -hmm. So this total number times the 
uh, acquisition cost, which is this 10 cents plus the 75 cents. So that's a total of 121,800 of OA, $8. So you got a sense about you know, how much cost those catalog companies spend up front. So when you receive a catalog in your mailbox, you can see, you know, you can imagine they probably have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars because of you know, doing that. Right? <laughs> but if they do that smartly, they can lower the uh, cost of dramatically, which we're going to talk um, in the next uh, case. Um, average acquisition customer, uh, I'm sorry, so the <laughs> acquisition cost of, you know, um, per customer, right, is this total number divided by number of customers, right? So that's uh, $37. And annual marketing cost, why there's an annual marketing cost is because, you know, those people <coughs> become customers. Um, but the next year, um, in order for them to buy, right, you still need to send them catalogs, right? right. So it's basically, it looks like this company is sending eight catalogs per year, and that catalog is worth 75 cents, right? Oh. So they don't need to pay rent in those, you know, annual recurring um, catalogs because they already have those people as customers, right? So, um, so this is the um, total cost, marketing cost per year, which is $6. Cost of goods is estimated as 58% of total revenue. So if if they buy $100 of stuff, uh, the cost of that 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 product is $55. They probably, you know, you're saying their their cost of goods should be much lower than the price that, you know, they're selling, right? That makes sense because, you know, if you if they don't have a higher gross margin, then chances are they are not going to make that much money. But the thing is that this probably includes all of those costs. I, I don't know how you know this is aggregated. All right, so we can use the LTV to make business decision. Now we can start a LTV calculation for those customers. So I have a in class um, exercise for that. Yeah. Cool. Good. So uh, we just done that, and our business decision, of course, is is no way, right? We're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna give gifts. Yeah. Yeah. So. But essentially, you are paying high purchase price later yeah. on. <laughs> that's how they make money. All right, so key takeaways of this customer LT calculation. I think we just completed right the entire um, section. You know the concept. You know how to how to make LT calculations. You know the model. You know the key decision points. That's the key. So you know if you if you need to take this on in your company, you need to go out to find this information. Once you have those information, hey, you just plug in, you got all the LTV. It's that simple. Uh, it's just, you know, in the real world, you need to make sure your numbers are validated and making sense. So you better to have a partner from finance, maybe from marketing, to be your kind of, you know, input or sponsor to, um, to, 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 to make this calculation. So key takeaways, right? Business value drivers, as indicated by this um, calculation, is very uh, clear, right? Retention, uh, retention rate is very important. Um, so, you know, sales and revenue is very important. You want it to be, you know, increased. Increasing sales and revenue can definitely increase the LTV. Increased the retention rate definitely increase LTV. Increased the referrals, right? Which we didn't, we didn't do. We didn't include in the model. But we talked about it, and if you want, you can include it in that model, right? In this Excel model, you can have a row saying, um, maybe, maybe here, right? After the cost, uh, or I'm sorry, after the um, after the revenue, you can you can add another row here, name it as average referring re referral average. Okay, average revenue from referral, right? Like referral. Yeah. You can you can do that level of estimate and put that put 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 that data into this model, and you can you can get you know the referral customer advocacy and referral considered LTV number, and that number is usually much higher than 
because there's a goodwill in, in it, right? That's what I said, right? So uh, that number is much higher than this number. So reduced cost definitely ha has an effect. Reduced marketing cost definitely has an effect. Um, and how to use it, right? So you use the LTV calculation to make business decisions mostly on uh, customer acquisition, retention, development. Um, you had a good point. Um, you know, maybe you know, version acquisition can use it as well. They don't use it, you know, directly. They they use it indirectly. All right. So um, this is this lecture about customer value. Um, how to quantify customer value, and this is about to answer the questions that we brought up. You know, in the very beginning, right? How much does a customer work? Uh, now you have a model to, you know, you know, you know this model to do that, right? Um, and this is actually the the only model that I know uh, to answer this question. So now you got it, right? You have it in the tool set. Um, Yesterday we talked about you know how do you measure customer satisfaction that NPS. So now you have two concrete models to just assess customer um, value as well as customer satisfaction. In the next lecture, in the next hour, we're going to talk about. So first, talking about very simple um, concept, right? In statistics or you know data science in general, uh, the causal effect and experiment design. Um, so let's say if you if you do something right in the corporate world, if you run a marketing campaign, you want to know that you know if you run an initiative and you see the outcome, you want to know that you know if this outcome is really caused by the initiative that you're running, right? So um, it. Oftentimes, it's very challenging to be able to, you know, draw that kind of association. Um, the best that you can get is correlation. Right? You see this initiative and you see this outcome, so that's a correlation. That's not necessarily causal effect, because there are many other factors, right, can, you know, uh, impact the outcome. And maybe, you know, a big chunk of the outcome was generated by other effect, and not this, you know particular initiative that you're taking on. <coughs> so let's take a let's let us let us look at an example here. It's called a Subaru uh, cash promotion um, scenario. Um, it Subaru is a car manufacturer, right? Once there's a typo here, sorry. So so it wants to know whether a promotion worked and this promotion is um, in New England in 2006, and definition of this, you know, promotions that um, they extend, they extend two thousand dollars in cash to all cars in one month, right? In the in a way to increase the sales, <coughs> in a way to promote their car and increase the sales. So some of the background information here, right? Car promotions are main way. Cash promotions are main way to change price, because they don't change your MSRP <coughs> over the year. They don't change the invoice price either, right? Do you guys know the difference MSRP invoice price and <coughs> and, uh, and uh, final sales price? You guys, you, you guys must have known it. Um, Can you quickly explain? Yeah. <laughs> okay. MSRP basically. Is the least price, right? That's the highest. If you pay that price, <laughs> yeah, it's the least price. If you pay that price, you're basically you're screwed, right? Okay. People, people make, you you may be able to save thousands of dollars off the MSRP. Mm -hmm. So uh, invoice price is the is is basically you know what's the uh, what's what's the price that the dealer get get a car from the manufacturer mm -hmm. company. So that's their cost. You cannot get their invoice price, I think, unless they have some other programs in place, mm -hmm. right? So in, invoice price is substantially lower in um, compared with MSRP. Usually, you know, you'll get a little bit higher than the invoice price. Just leave a little bit buffer for the sales guy to make make some money. Um, but you know they have some other incentives, so their true cost usually is lower than their in invoice cost. Yeah. Uh, especially when there is a cash promotion, right? Uh, you can get you know um, car 
a real purchase price much lower than the invoice price as well. All right, some background, right? Cash promotions are main way to change price. So they don't, they don't lower the price. Instead, they say, hey, I give you some cash back or some other incentives. And the demand changes a lot month over month. Let's say you know people may not buy that much in January. People may buy starting to buy cars in February, right? It's understandable due to lots of factors, weather, you know, locations, and so on. Um, invoice prices rarely change over the course of model year. Meaning, you know, the the dealer who pays the manufacturer to get a car, that price will not change that much. So because the sales is, was slow in January, so they're thinking about the promotion in February, right, to, you know, to give $2,000 in cash. Um, their business goal is to increase sales um, 20%. <laughs> so, um, Selling four wheel drive cubers. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't say any model, just general, in general. Yes, yeah, in general. Yeah. So they observed, right? <clears throat> I would say maybe by the end of February, they observed 33% of increase uh, from January um, car sales. That's a, that you know that's a pretty pretty yeah. dramatic increase. Yeah. But you know, did the promotion achieve its goal, which is 20% increase from January, right? Yeah. Well, from this yeah. number, it seems like it's achieved. But you know, is that because of promotion or because because yes, it's not. or their competitors screwed up, right? <laughs> Who knows? So one other kind of reference point is that in the New York area, the sales from January to February also increased 24%, right? And they don't run a promotion because this promotion was only run in New England. So basically, you know, if you compare these two different geo uh, regions, right, um, then you kind of have been having a doubt about whether you know the promotion really achieves its goal of including uh, increasing. Uh, sales by 20%, even if you do see the, the sales increases 33%, right? Because, well, they, you know, they, other places they, without they, promotion... They increased 9% more than the others, and they still were 13% over their goal. Oh, yeah. That yeah. sounds like a win. Yeah. So that, let's, let's move on, right? So how do we prove that an initiative worked? Uh, we need to know if we run this initiative, the desired outcome occurs. In this case, introduce promotion, increase sales by 33%. The desired, the desired outcome occurs when we run uh, the initiative, which happens, right? We know that. But if we do not run the initiative, the desired outcome does not occur. Meaning, you know, introduce uh, promotion, no increase in sales, the outcome was not caused by other factors, right? Mm. So um, this is exactly what is the kind of test or experiment does. So let me go to this kind of testing um, slide. So what need to, we need to answer four questions, right? First, what is the initiative that you want to test? Is that you want to test, you know, the sales increase? I'm sorry, is that you're, you're going to test, you know, a promotion in, you know, um, um, cash incentive, or are you going to test that in a free gift, right, for the initial purchaser? What is the outcome you're interested in improving? Is that revenue, is that commercial rate? To test the initiative, who should be included in the target group, who should be included in the control group, yeah. So we need to, you know, answer these four questions. Conducting the test is conceptually very straightforward, right? Knowing from the previous slide, four questions, and over here, the target group is targeted with the initiative. Control group is not targeted with the initiative. You compare the outcome between these two groups, and the difference is change, right, caused by the initiative. Conceptually, very straightforward, very simple. Uh, but in the real world, ideally, right, ideally, you assign customers to the um, to their control groups, uh, and control group and target group randomly, complete randomly, and if you can do that, right, definitely you will know the causal effect. Um, but you know, completely random assignment are often very very hard to implement in in practice, especially in the kind of real world uh, um, real world um, practice. If it's online, it's much easier to implement. 
Right. So let's say you know if you run a website and on this website you either you know do e-commerce or do whatever right news um, for your company's own website. You do A/B testing and that A/B testing is very easy to you know for you to assign <coughs> visitors randomly to program A and program B. But in the real world, right? Let's say if you have a store, it's not easy for you to shift your customers to directly ship directly your customer to this area versus that area, this promotion versus that promotion. It's very hard to do that. So how to do that, right? Um, we introduce a method called difference in difference. And this method also called double delta. Yeah. So um, so the short name is DD in either of these names. So that's a good coincidence. Um, what it does is that it assigns people to groups by time and geography. So it's basically two dimensions, right? And in these two dimensions, this is an example. This is how it works. So first you pick two geographic regions. You can do that by zip code depending on, you know, um, what you're measuring. If it's, you know, uh, consumers, you can do that. You can do that by regional sales offices, right? Like the um, car manufacturer um, case, you have New England, you have New York, you, you can even have, you know, kind of San Francisco region, Bay Area region, right? <coughs> so you pick two regions well that you have uh, business with. And you pick two time periods, right? You can do that by week, week one, week two, or you can do that by month, month one, month two. So here is the example of two regions and two time periods. And uh, each time period is four weeks, right? So now you have four different groups of customers or prospects. Um, three of them are control groups. So you know, region one is a control region. Both both groups in this in this time frame in this time period they are two separate control groups. And for region two, this is your control group and this is your um, target group. Okay. Um, the idea is that you know this represents time in uh, the x-axis, and the vertical axis represents um, the outcome. Right. So, in time <coughs> period one, you observe that you know um, the, the the original sales one is over here, original sales two is over here. The the, I think the, the assumption in this method is that you assume that difference, right? The original difference is going to um, going to be maintained. The basically, you know, going to be parallel, going to use um, uh, time time frame number second time frame, right? The main assumption of this method is is assuming this will this original difference will will be will be the same. Mm -hmm. As time goes by from you know, okay. period one to period two, this is the, the difference is going to maintain. Okay. However, right, because you run an incentive program, so you kind of change what's happening in, um, in region two, right? So you observe the outcome is here instead of here. So, you know, the distance from here to here, right, that's the uh, treatment effect. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, or you know the program effect, the campaign effect. Let, let's take an example, right? Um, in this case, we call that home alarm. Home alarm is you know a kind of security monitor company, just like ADT, right? Uh, security alarm system. They install it. They install it for you. A lot of times, it's completely free. Then they will charge you a monthly monitor fee. So for those of you, you know that owner, house or apartment, you want to set it up, right? They can. They can they can they can call you or call the police department whenever they detect a uh, breach in security. So um, the initiative that they want to measure is they they used to only charge thirty dollar. Um, RMR stands for recurring monthly revenue. So you know they, they used to charge they used to sell this program, which priced as thirty dollars per month. It's basically, you know, if you sign up, you pay thirty dollars per month for the service. Right? 
So that's what he's, what he's talking about. So instead of that, now they are they are changing their pricing to you know charge forty dollars for um, for systems that need more than six sensors. So let's say if you have a very large home, right? You need to install a lot of sensors in the in the house for the system to work. And if you need more than six sensors, they will charge you forty dollars instead of thirty dollars now. Mm -hmm. For those of you that still you know use less than six, need less than six sensors, you still get that thirty dollar deal. Okay, so that's the that's that's their initiative. They want to test. All right. So the outcome they want to test is increased total um, recurring monthly revenue, right? So um, the design is to design the target group as a group of customers who will be offered both options, right? Option one, thirty dollars per month if less than six sensors. Option two, forty dollars per month if more than six sensors. Um, <laughs> These two options are available. Customers coming in, they will be offered. They 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 will, they will be they will be presented right with these two offers. And the customers have option of picking the first one, the second one, or not buy at all. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's why you will see the average is could be less than thirty dollars. Is because some of the customers don't buy. So what is the control group? Right. The control group is. The group of customers who continue to be offered at thirty dollars price. Well, how many how many sensors? Uh, any sensors. Yeah. So you can have more than six. That's the con control group. Right? Yeah, that's so you can group. have ten wireless. Yeah. So yeah. open is no limit. Yeah. Yeah. So here is the result, right? So after they run, you know, for the second period, they got this result back. And now the question is that how much is the effect of the promotion, right? So let me just highlight, you know, the uh, result. So for the first control group in region one, the average return, uh, I'm sorry, um, recurring monthly revenue is twenty, twenty dollars. I should say twenty dollars. Right. In the second control group, which is in region two, uh, is twenty three dollars, right? And third group is sixteen dollars, and target group which being offered with the new offer, new um, choice, is twenty five. Interesting. Yeah, it's um, <coughs> average, it's, you know kind of average recurring monthly revenue of twenty five. So they want to know how much is the effect of the promotion. Yep. So consider these two things, right? Time, seasonality difference. And the um, the uh, regional difference. All right. So I think should we make a decision to stop right now, and we'll continue next Friday.